when we talk about this concept of injustice and dealing with zulm. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself saying, O oh my servants, I have made oppression, injustice, forbidden for myself, and I've made it forbidden for you. فَلَا تَظَالَمُوا Do not wrong one another. Imam Sufyan al-Thawri rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, never other than this, prohibits something upon himself. For Allah to distance himself from transgression and oppression, to a point that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I have made it haram for me. The ultimate soul legislator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala distances himself from a zulm and says, who are you then to wrong one another? Who are you then to carry out an injustice against your brother or sister in humanity or in faith? Because we wrong one another out of a false illusion of power and authority. The tyrants of the world, both past, present, and even future, think that they have the authority to wrong other people. And that's why the Messenger وسلم, when he walked by a man once who was beating a servant, he said to him, Allah is more capable of doing that to you than you are to him. And the Prophet وسلم, feared it for himself وسلم, We're talking about our Messenger وسلم, and understanding the relevance of the Messenger وسلم, to our times and to our context. The Prophet وسلم, as Usaid ibn Hudayr anhu, narrates that one time the Prophet وسلم, he poked one of the young Ansar as he was laughing too hard just to tell him to calm down a little bit. And Usaid says that that young man stood up to the Prophet وسلم, and said, Allow me to avenge myself. The Prophet ﷺ could have easily said, do you know who I am? I don't have time for your games right now. We're going through something. We're kind of in the middle of battle and important things. Can we do this later? Rasulullah ﷺ, he says to him, go ahead and poke back. Go ahead and do it. And you know what he says back to him? He says, Ya Rasulullah, you have a shirt on you. And I don't have a shirt on me. And the Prophet ﷺ lifts his shirt and the young man grabs the Prophet ﷺ and embraces his stomach and he says, that's all I really wanted from you, Ya Rasulullah. But look at the fear of the Prophet ﷺ. He feared it that much. Uthman ibn Affan عنه, because this was a culture now of fearing oppressing another being. Uthman عنه, at the age of 84 years old, the Khalifa of the Messenger ﷺ, he pinched a young man's ear and the young man looked at him. And he told him, you hurt me. Uthman is an old man. He could have said, shoo, just go along. But instead, Uthman who says, pinch my ear back. And the young man says, I'm a kid. I'm not going to pinch your ear. He says, go ahead and pinch. And he insisted until the young man put his hands on his ears. And he said, pinch harder. Because the taking back, the revenge of this world is far less than the revenge of the hereafter. Go ahead and pinch harder. Hurt me so that I can feel it. So that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't take me to account for that on the day of judgment. That was the fear that the Prophet ﷺ put in the heart of his companions. For wronging another human being. However, we go a step further. It's one thing to not wrong. It's another thing to stand with those who are oppressed and those who are wronged. To stand with the weak, to stand with the downtrodden, to stand with people that are oppressed, to stand with people who are not given their rights. And the Prophet ﷺ profoundly addressed this attitude in the companions as well. If you were to see the Prophet ﷺ and his companions in Mecca, they were an abused, downtrodden group of people that supported the Prophet ﷺ. There were some Abu Bakr's. There were some Abdul Rahman ibn Aufs, but they were the exception, they were not the norm. People that had been abused their entire lives on the basis of their race, on the basis of their economic status, victims of tribalism, the brutal system of tribalism, those were the people surrounding the Prophet ﷺ. You were looking at Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the blind poor man. You were looking at Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the mu'adhin of the Prophet ﷺ who was tortured in every imaginable way. That's who was with the Prophet ﷺ. This was an abused group of people. This was a people that had suffered before Islam and Islam empowered him. You had all kinds of people around the Prophet ﷺ. And you know what? Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, who's a noble man, he looks around at these people and he's thinking to himself like, wow, this is our ummah. And Rasulullah ﷺ looks at Sa'ad and he sees that and he says, does Allah support you or give you victory 
except by virtue of your weak ones, of your vulnerable ones. And the ulama interpret that statement in two ways. Number one, that those same people that you think are weak, because weakness is a perception in our eyes. We think they're weak, they're not weak. Society might have tried to render them weak, but they're not weak. Those same people that you look at and you belittle are the same people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will establish the religion on their backs. And that's exactly what happens. And you know what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because we as human beings naturally target those of influence. And you know what? I want to underline this. We should not focus our da'wah only on people of influence. Underline only. There is a place in Islam for doing da'wah to people in authority and people in power and people who hold influential positions. But we should not focus our da'wah only on them. Why do I say that? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said it to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Keep yourself patient with those people that might be perceived as weak, but they call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala day and night, seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's pleasure, seeking his face, seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's glory and his help. Those are the people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give victory to this religion through. And you know what's amazing? When the people of status started to enter into the religion, did the Prophet sallallahu hold an award ceremony, give Bilal a medal, give Khabbab a medal, and say thank you for your services, but now we're going to put other people in these positions? Absolutely not. Bilal was always the mu'adhin of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu was the close friend of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam in Medina to a point that people thought he was from Ahl al-Bayt. He was from the family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam because of how close the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam kept him to him. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam didn't say thank you guys but now we have Umar ibn al-Khattab. Now we have other people that can take the role. No. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought greatness to those people and a lot through those people. And a lot of times we think that when we do da'wah to only people of influence, that's the only way this religion will be given glory. And it's never been the case and it will not be the case today. And the second meaning of that hadith, which is the more correct one, as Al-Khattabi rahimahullah ta'ala says, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala judges a people by the way they take care of the oppressed amongst them. Allah will judge a people by the way they deal with their own vulnerable. If the people turn their backs, and yes, it's from the greatest signs of the Day of Judgment, the Prophet ﷺ asked, who was the one that asked me about when the Day of Judgment is? Rasulullah ﷺ, he said, when trust is lost, then wait for the Day of Judgment. And they said, how is it possible that trust can be lost, Ya Rasulullah? He said, when people that don't deserve to be in leadership are placed in positions of leadership. It's very convenient for us to think that one day everything is going to be okay, that you know, the rulers will be just, the presidents will be just, the kings will be just, that all you know, people who are in religious leadership will be moral and righteous and upright. As Sufyan al-Thawri rahimahullah ta'ala said, there are two groups of people. If they are righteous, then the entire ummah will be righteous. And if they are corrupt, the entire ummah will be corrupt. He said, al-muluk wal ulama People who are in authority and the scholars. Those who are in a place of moral and religious authority. But that's not likely to happen. It's happened very little in our ummah's history, in fact, where both of those classes were fully righteous and could be trusted and the ummah could follow in their footsteps. Meaning we are left to ourselves. And we have to ask ourselves, how do we treat the poor amongst us? Where is our war on poverty? Where is our war on that dhulm that's been committed against them? Because that's a transgression as well. Where is our war on that? Where is our sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa when he used to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allahumma inni as'aluka fi'l al-khayrat wa tark al-munkarat wa hubb al-masakeen. Oh Allah, I ask you for the ability to do good deeds to abandon sins and for the love of the poor. Where is the love of the poor? Where is our looking to Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu? The man who felt like the cloth of the Kaaba didn't need to be changed because poor people were more deserving of having their clothes given to them. Where is the example of Abdullah, his son, Abdullah ibn Umar, who wouldn't have a meal unless there was an orphan at the table? Where is the example of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, the grandson? who when he was passing away and the royalty of the world came to his door to accompany him, he chose to surround himself with the poor. Because he said, these people are closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the people I want to be around. 
as I depart from this world. That's part of our religion. That's part of our faith to take up the cause of the vulnerable. That when we go to any society, when we are within any land, that whoever is oppressed in that land, whoever is being wronged, that becomes our cause by extension of our humanity and, by, and of our faith. As the Prophet ﷺ, and you know, think about this. Rasulullah ﷺ, all of the verses of caring for the poor and, and, and fighting transgression and fighting oppression, they didn't come in Medina. They started in Mecca. The verse, وَإِذَا الْمَوْؤُودَةُ سُئِلَتْ بِأَيِّ ذَنْبٍ قُتِلَتْ When the young girl who was buried alive is asked, for what reason were you killed? That's a Mecca verse. وَيْلٌ لِلْمُطَفِّفِينَ That's late Mecca, early Medina. These are early messages, economic, trans, economic oppression. Wronging people on the basis of their gender. Wronging people on the basis of their race and on their tribes. These are Mecca messages. And you know what? The Prophet ﷺ, when he was approached by a people who were being wronged. You know, a man comes to the Prophet ﷺ and tells him, Abu Jahl owes me money. And this is in Mecca. The Prophet ﷺ doesn't say to him, I've got bigger problems with Abu Jahl. You worry about your money. He's trying to kill me. The Prophet ﷺ takes his cause as his own. Because he knows that the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes through helping others that are being wronged and that are being oppressed. When we are here in this society, when we are part and parcel of, this fabric, of, of the fabric of this country, it is for us, upon us, to ally, to ally ourselves, to be allies of those who are being wronged and those who are vulnerable, no matter who they are. But dear brothers and sisters, to address What's, what, what you perceive to be an unjust reaction to a system that is unjust, without addressing the system, that is a form of injustice in and of itself. That's a form of dhulm in and of itself. When you sit there and you talk about you know, the, the riots without addressing what causes people to take to the streets and not involving yourself as a community or as an, as an individual, with those who are being systematically wronged and have been systematically wronged for so many years. That in and of itself is dhulm. That in and of itself is an injustice. That's a transgression. That's your job. That's my job. And let's stop with the appropriation nonsense. A friend of mine mentioned this today. When we sit there and we say, but we've got bigger issues to worry about. And we've got these people being wronged over there. And we've got these people being wronged over there. That's like going to someone's funeral and saying, I'm not going to grieve for you or pray janaza because I've got my own janaza to tend to. It makes no sense. It's not from our religion. It's hypocritical. The Prophet ﷺ didn't do that. Rasulullah ﷺ never turned down the need of a person because his own need وسلم, was more important at the time. Every need needs to be addressed by us. Every single one of them. It's our job as a community. It's the sunnah of our messenger وسلم, and our Prophet ﷺ. SubhanAllah, I want to leave you with a very beautiful narration from Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu. You know, when we become distressed, when we find ourselves vulnerable, when we, when we find ourselves in need of someone, what we usually turn to is we turn first and foremost to our outlets and we vent about how terrible our lives are. We call the Imam maybe. We go find someone that we can talk to, call our friends. Very few of us will call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says about the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, I've never seen anyone in my life with a haja, with a need, that he went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam turned away from him even if the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was suffering himself. When the Sahaba would, be in, would feel any hardship inside of themselves, when the Sahaba felt like they needed someone to talk to. They knew they could go to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When they felt like they needed some money, they needed some help, they knew they could go to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When they felt like, you know, things were getting tough on them in this world, they just needed to talk about life. They knew they could go to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When they were hungry, they knew they could go to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, though he himself was hungry, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would never turn them away. He'd never look away. It's time for us to not look away. Shaykh al-Islam bin Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, he says, Allah will establish a just nation even if it's a, it's a disbelieving nation. And he will destroy an oppressive nation even if it's a Muslim nation. His student Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never destroyed a nation 
because, of, of, because only it's theological disbelief. But Allah Azza wa Jal says, we destroyed nations when they became oppressive. So when we stand up for those that are being wronged, systematically wronged, that's something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to us and it's, a, it's an obligation of faith and it's also what true patriotism is. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us the people that stand for the rights of the oppressed, that stand for the rights of those who are being wronged, to not make us ourselves transgressors or oppressors, not even by our silence. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not to make us a people who see wrong being committed in front of them and who abandon those people that are being wronged and who neglect those that are wronged. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the ability to do good, to avoid evil, and for the love of the poor. Allahumma ameen. Assalamu alaikum Islam Box family. We need your support more than ever. Your support can help us continue to educate and motivate people to make and publish videos daily. Jazakallah.